Hello there, my name's Robbie, aka The Model Boat Guy, and today I'm doing a video on Titanic's central propeller. Now, why am I doing this? Well, most of you probably know me from my um, model building videos. I'm currently building a large 1 to 200 scale model of Titanic, and one of the most frequently asked questions I get is why have you fitted a three bladed central propeller? Now, the answer to this is actually quite interesting, and I've had a look, and I can't see any other videos on YouTube. Uh, relating to the subject, so I thought I'd make a video about it today. Um, most of this video is based on a very, very good article on Encyclopedia Titanica that addresses the issue of Titanic's central propeller. Um, so I'll pop a link in the description below to that, but do just bear in mind that all of the research and stuff is done in that article. This isn't really my research at all, I'm really just sort of putting that article into a video format. But it is a very good read, so I'd encourage you to go and read it if you're interested. Anyway, without any further ado, Let's crack on. Now, as most of you probably know, Titanic was one of three near-identical ships, all built by the Belfast shipbuilder Harland & Wolf. Uh, the first was RMS Olympic, and she entered service in 1911. Then came Titanic, which entered service in 1912. And finally, we have the HMHS Britannic that entered service in 1915. Now, because Olympic was the first ship in the series, she was the one that got all of the attention. Um, she was heavily photographed internally and externally. Um, journalists wrote quite numerous pieces about her. Um, engineering magazines covered her at length. Um, she really was the poster girl for the White Star Line. Um, so when Titanic came along a year later, um, the White Star Line tried very hard to emphasise the fact that the Titanic was new and exciting and interesting. Uh, and, and they pushed various different things. You know, they, they pushed the fact that Titanic was slightly heavier than Olympic, which made her the largest ship in the world, which, which indeed she was. Uh, and they, they pushed various different aspects of Titanic, which had been improved upon Olympic. But the reality was that Titanic was a near identical copy of Olympic. So because of this, only areas that were actually new to Titanic were photographed to any degree. Uh, an example of this is the Café Parisien, which is a sort of French-style café uh, located on the starboard side of B-Deck. Um, but this was added to the Titanic, it was totally new, it wasn't on the Olympic. And so this was photographed. Um, but areas that were similar between the two ships were not photographed again. And an example of this is this photo, for example, of the Grand Staircase. We commonly today mistake this as being Titanic. It's not. This is a photo of Olympic's Grand Staircase. Another really good example is uh, these two photos of the propellers. Again, if you Google Titanic's propellers, these photos come up in abundance. But the reality is, this is not Titanic. This is Olympic. And of course, this all makes perfect sense. You know, in 1912, photography was not an inexpensive art form. You couldn't just whip out your smartphone and snap away as many pictures as you wanted. Photography was expensive. And so, if you were a journalist, or if you were the White Star Line, why would you waste money photographing a ship which is nearly identical to the ship you photographed a year earlier? You wouldn't do it. But what this means is that we have loads and loads of photographs of Olympic, which we commonly mistake for Titanic. And this goes for the propellers as well. Um, there are no known photographs of Titanic's propellers from before she sank. And what this means is, we don't really have any first-hand information on what propellers were fitted to Titanic. So what we have to do is weigh up evidence that we do have, and so there's various things we can use. We can look at Titanic's wreck site, and sure enough, that does show us the two wing propellers that Titanic was fitted with. Unfortunately, in the case of the central propeller, it is buried in the sediment at the bottom of the ocean, so we can't see that. So what else can we do? Well, we can make educated guesses. We can look at, for example, Olympic and say, right, well, Olympic was clearly fitted with a four-bladed central propeller, so the likelihood is Titanic was also fitted with the same. And we can do the same with Britannic. If you look at the wreck site of Britannic, you can clearly see a four-bladed central propeller was installed. Um, now, whilst these things are helpful in sort of giving us an idea of what might have been, that's exactly what they do. They say what might have been. Neither of these are first-hand sources on what Titanic was actually fitted with. Um, but until recently, really, this was the only information we had to go on. 
However, quite recently, and I've been unable to find out just how recently, um, but in the relatively recent past, an engineering notebook from Harland and Wolff was published. Um, and in this notebook, there were various different tables which detailed the propulsion equipment fitted to all Harland and Wolff vessels of the time. And there are entries for both Olympic and Titanic. So I'm going to go through what this notebook said. And so here is a photo of the original notebook. And you can see on the top, it's got propellers and then engines. Uh, and then on the left hand side, there is a column of numbers starting at 393. And then it goes up 393, 394, 399, 400, 401. Now, these numbers refer to ships. In a big shipyard like Harland and Wolf, things would get very complicated very quickly because you would have orders arriving, you know, orders of metal arriving daily, rivets arriving daily, wooden fixtures arriving. And it would become very, very tricky to work out what is destined for which ship. So what Harland and Wolf did was when a ship was started, it was assigned a unique number. In the case of Olympic, that was 400. And in the case of Titanic, that was 401. And the idea was quite simple. If I was delivering 300 hull plates for Olympic, I would stamp them all with the number 400, and then it would be very clear where those hull plates needed to go. Now, I've just changed the photo here, and the reason for that is the, um, the original notebook is very lovely, um, but it's handwritten and the figures are very small, so it's quite difficult to read some of the information on it. Um, so this is a computer-generated image. Uh, I think it's an Excel spreadsheet, but this holds exactly the same information as the notebook. It's just tabulated in a more easy-to-understand format. Now, this table shows us something very interesting, but let's start at the start. So we can see that in June 1911, we see Olympic's original propeller configuration. But interestingly, just underneath that, in November 1911, we can see that Olympic's propeller configuration has changed. It's only her wing propellers that have been altered, but we can see that the pitch of the wing propellers has increased from 33 feet to 34 feet 6 inches. Now, why would they do this? Well, it's all to do with efficiency and vibration. So let's talk about efficiency first. Now, I know it seems a bit strange to talk about efficiency in 1911. You know, I think to a lot of people, efficiency is quite a modern concept, you know, concerned with reducing our carbon emissions and that sort of thing. But the truth of the matter is people were just as concerned about efficiency in 1911 as they are today, albeit because of different motives. What we've got to remember is that the White Star Line, first and foremost, is a business. And if they can get their ships from one side of the ocean to the other for cheaper, they will. And one way that you can do that is by getting as efficient a propellers as possible installed on your ships. So what the White Star Line are doing here is they are fiddling around with Olympic's propeller configuration to try to find out the most efficient means of propelling her. Now the other consideration is vibration. As a propeller rotates, it produces vibrations. The most efficient propeller design that you could come up with is a one-bladed propeller, but clearly it would be horribly balanced, and therefore the vibration would be absolutely intolerable. Remember, this is a ship. People live on it. Um, so comfort is a genuine consideration. Um, so perhaps a happy medium is a two-bladed propeller. That gives you a reduction in efficiency, but also a reduction in vibration. A three-bladed propeller gives you an even greater reduction in efficiency, and an even greater reduction in vibration, so on and so on and so on. Clearly, there is a sweet spot somewhere in between where we can find a propeller configuration that gives us a good efficiency and also low vibrations. Of course, in a modern world, we would use computers and things to do that, but that really wasn't an option back in 1911. So the easiest thing to do was, when you get the opportunity, change the propellers and see the result. Unfortunately, or perhaps unfortunately for the White Star Line, they got an opportunity to change Olympic's propellers in November 1911. At the start of a westbound voyage, Olympic was leaving Southampton when she collided with a British naval vessel, the HMS Hawk. Um, and unfortunately, both ships were really quite badly damaged by the incident. Um, that's a photo of the damage that Olympic sustained, and the entire bow of the HMS Hawk was severely crumpled. This is a photo of it here. Um, Olympic was able to limp back to Southampton, where her voyage was cancelled, and she was given a temporary repair before returning to Belfast. 
and it's clear that whilst Olympic was dry docked in Belfast, the White Star Line took that opportunity to tweak her propeller configurations ever so slightly to see if they could improve the efficiency of the ship. However, a few months later, her sister ship, Titanic, came along to start her maiden voyage. Now, this presented the White Star Line with a relatively unusual opportunity, because, of course, the Olympic and Titanic were nigh on identical. They were built from the same plans, they had the same hull shape, they were pretty much the same weight, certainly nothing that you couldn't make adjustments for. So this gave White Star Line an opportunity to put different configurations of propellers on different ships, and compare and contrast the performance of the two. Clearly, whichever ship was the least efficient would be updated to have the more efficient propeller configuration at the first opportunity. So it stands to reason that Titanic's propeller configuration was subtly different once again. And we can see that the wing propellers are almost identical to that of Olympics, except for the fact that their pitch has once again been increased from 34 feet 6 inches to 35 feet. And this probably accounts for why the White Star Line claimed Titanic would be almost half a knot faster while crossing the Atlantic. But the interesting thing, and the most pertinent thing for today's video, is that we can quite clearly see on the entry for Titanic's central propeller, it's listed as having three blades, not four. This isn't four blades crossed out and replaced with three. Plain and simple, it's stated as having three blades. Now, as far as I'm aware, this is the only piece of first-hand evidence that gives us any information on Titanic's central propeller. So to me, this is enough evidence to persuade me that Titanic's central propeller was three-bladed. However, there's something slightly more that can actually give us a bit more confidence that this might have been the case. We can see in the next entry that in March 1913, Olympic was once again back in Belfast. This time she was in for a fairly lengthy overhaul, and this was of course to bring her up to date with the new safety regulations that had been brought in after the sinking of Titanic. And we can see that in this entry, she is being fitted with a three-bladed central propeller. Now what this suggests is that Olympic was being fitted out to perform the experiment that Titanic had not completed. Because Titanic's career was cut short so early, the White Star Line wouldn't have been able to gain any useful information about the three-bladed central propeller's performance. Now clearly this was not a particularly successful test, um, because we don't know when, but we do know that by 1919 Olympic had once again returned to a four-bladed central propeller. So this forces us to conclude that either the three-bladed central propeller didn't give us the increase in efficiency that we are after, or possibly that the increase in vibrations generated by the three-bladed propeller was too much to justify the change. So whilst we don't have any photographic evidence, this notebook seems to be the only first-hand source we have which sheds any light on Titanic's central propeller. And as there is no real other source information to contradict it, for now, I am forced to conclude that Titanic's central propeller was three-bladed. And that is why, on my model, I have shown it thus. So, that's the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, as I said at the start, um, this is entirely based off the article on Encyclopedia Titanica that I've linked in the description below. So I can't really claim any credit for the research or anything that's gone into this, but... Um, I hope it's been interesting nonetheless. Thank you very much to Encyclopedia Titanica for that article. Uh, it's a really good read. Um, if you've got any questions, comments, whatever, you, pop them down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll be back soon with more modelling. However, bye for now.